Thank you for coming to the Research Information Center today, and uh, welcome to the Meet the Researcher. I'd like to introduce Dr. Walter Rogan, and he's going to talk to you today about the Rochester Epidemiology Project. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming. So, who is from Olmsted County? Raise your hand. Are you from Olmsted County? Okay. Who is from southeastern Minnesota? Okay. Who is from west central Wisconsin? Nobody from Wisconsin here, okay? They don't cross the river. Okay. So, I, I'm asking this because you may or may not know, but the Rochester Epidemiology Project is now covering a region of 27 counties in southeastern Minnesota and western Wisconsin, central western Wisconsin. So uh, quite, quite bigger than it used to be. So, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the Rochester Epidemiology Project, let's begin from, the, from small, is a system to do research using medical records. So the idea is to take people that live in a place, in a, in a county or in a town or in a city or in a region, and then put together all of the medical information that they generate by seeing doctors, by taking medication, just in their normal life. And then we ask these people for permission to put all of this data together and use the data for research. And if you keep doing this for one year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you get a very big collection of information. And then you can design studies which you can then um, use to answer questions, medical questions and public health questions. And the reason why this is special is because you need to have long time information. It's not enough just to have two or three years. You need to have 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Technically, you would like to have the full life of people from birth through to now, and this of course sometimes happens, sometimes it's difficult, but even just 20, 30 years would be very useful. So for example, if you want to know whether having an accident, a, a trauma of your head or something, and to what happened you later, 20, 30 years later, you need to have document about that accident 20 years before. Or if you want to know that you took certain medications or you had certain uh, habit like drinking coffee, drinking wine, smoking, or doing other things. You want to know how that relates to what happened when you get old. You need to have the data collected. So the record linkage system of the Rochester Epidemiology Project does precisely that. So we take all of these data, we put them together, we link them, and so we make sure that we, for each person we know the full set of data. And then we design studies, and then we ask questions to the data, and we get answers. And so, uh, if you have not picked it up, you should pick up a brochure. We have brochures on the table that tell you, tell you about the project. One is in English, one is in Spanish. So if you like Spanish, you can have it in Spanish. Otherwise, English is easy. And also, if you look in the back, there is a website. And if you like computers, I know some people in, the, in my generation don't like computers as much as kids. But if you like computer, you can go into the website, and we have videos of the system. We have all of the study that we have produced, and so you can go in and explore and, and find interesting things. I think I will close now with this, and I'd rather take questions so it will be more interactive. Questions? Yes. Okay. So, um, and this is what we are talking about. This is the map of the Midwest with Minnesota and Wisconsin. The, and you see the region that we are covering. It's all indicated in the brochure. Now, for Olmsted County, which is precisely where we are now, we have the data going back 50 years. So in Olmsted County, this system has been going since 1966. So precisely 50 years this year, and that's why we are celebrating 50 years anniversary of this. Of course, I did not invent this because in 66 I was 11 years old, <coughs> but, but somebody did, and I just inherited this. Yes, I'm 60 now, so 
uh, the, the, the system has been going on for 50 years. So for Olmsted County, we have an amazing uh, series of data. When you go outside of Olmsted County for the 27 county region, we have about six, seven years of history. So it's more recent, more new, but the data are available electronically in the last six, seven years. And for the Rochester Epidemiology Project in Olmsted County, electronically you go back to 2003, 2004, before it's paper. So before you have to do it like in the library, you have to go there and dig through the, through the paper. But it's still available. Uh, other questions or comments? Well, it was just, how do you account for, when you get this data and you're asking questions, maybe this is one of your questions, is that there are a lot of um, people of a certain genetic background here. Yes. Then you can make only assumptions based on, I, I mean, do you take that into account when your data is being gathered because you couldn't, say, well, that would be true for, say, Japanese people or whatever. Okay, so very good question. Uh, as you know very well, Olmsted County, historically, until recently, was primarily a European I immigrant place. And this is true for, mid for the Midwest, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, the Dakotas, Illinois, more mixed. But certainly the central part mm -hmm. is very uh, European. Now, things have changed, though, and even in, in Olmsted County, we have had a number of influx. Primarily, the first were Vietnamese at the time of the Vietnam War, then Cambodian, Laotian, so Southeast Asian. Mm -hmm. And then we did have a number of waves of uh, Africans, primarily Somali. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a group of Filipinos, of course, a fair amount of Indians. Of course, it's not as... Uh, mixed as if you were in San Francisco or in New York, but uh, there is actually quite a fair amount of people that are not of European. So you can, you can oppose all of those different strands and you have enough data to do that. Yes, especially now going to the 27 county region, we will have big enough number to talk about other groups. Mm -hmm. But we have already done papers and I can um, forward you papers where we looked, for example, in Olmsted County, we were looking at people that get more than one disease, okay? People that get sick with more than one problem. They are called multimorbidity, or like more than one, okay? I have heart problems and respiratory problems. I have depression and I have a kidney problem. So this would be like combinations. Mm -hmm. And these combinations are very important to understand aging, to understand how we age, how fast we get old, and whether we are going to have a shortened life or not. It depends on this combination of diseases. So we were looking at this combination of diseases in Olmsted County. And we discovered that if you look at the Europeans in the middle, you have that the Asian tend to have less diseases with the same age and sex. And African American and blacks have more at the same age and sex. So we can see already in this community in the Midwest that there is a pattern, there's a, an orientation of the curves Indeed, our paper was quoted in Washington as an example of a study of ethnic differences in Minnesota, where people think that everybody's from Lake Wobegon, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, people think that in Minnesota everybody is, is Norwegian, right. Protestant, Lutheran, uh, speaks Minnesotan. Yeah, no, that's not quite the case. So it's, it's somewhat the case, but it's not completely the case. So we have been publishing papers, and we can um, uh, forward those to you, where we actually looked at ethnic differences. Going forward, I think we can do more, because if you go 27 county region and you start bringing in almost one million people, because here in Olmsted County we are 150,000. 150,000 people are living now in Olmsted County, in the small little square. If you go to 27 county region, you reach one million. And one million is a very serious population because you start seeing rare diseases, you can look at small groups, like you, I only want to study women 80 to 89. Then the group gets small. But if I have a one million to start with, I may have a big group of women 80 to 89, or children uh, 11 to 19, or you, know, you can choose groups. 
And then if you study certain diseases that are very rare, like pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, then also you like to have big numbers. What? That's me. <laughs> yes. Ah, okay. So those are rare, as you know. I know it's pretty rare. Fortunately. And, and uh, so uh, this will be possible going, going in a bigger. Also, when we go outside of Homestead County, we will have a lot of uh, people living in a rural region, low density, farmers, and people living in, in isolated communities. That's very interesting to look at the differences in diseases and problems. So. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah, sure. That's interesting talking to a researcher. Yes. They exist. They are strange beasts. Do doctors ever research people that have, have had a disease like cancer, yes. or cirrhosis or something, yeah. and are even more? Like I have an accident. I've had it. Sure. How many years? 30? Yeah. 20. 20. Yes. Yes. Does anyone research a person that's doing well? Doctors, if you're sick, if you're symptoms. Yes. But do they research? No. I, I live in a community, in yeah. a church. Yeah. We have persons that get cancer. Yeah. Certain ones die. Yeah. Certain ones do well. 30 years. Yeah. Now, does anyone say, what did you do different? Yeah. That made you live 30 years, and this guy here died? Absolutely. So, they both had breast cancer. Mm-hmm. One of them, do they have reach of researchers that? Go to people that are well Absolutely. and say they do. Absolutely, but to do, to do that, you need to have a population. You see, because if you, if, you say, if, you, if you sit in your office and you wait for patients to come to you, you get the most severe, the sicker, the, the one that have bigger problems. But the one that have the soft form of the disease, the less strong, you don't see them as much. Yeah. Sometimes, is there any research? I think that if if a doctor with a computer mm-hmm. could be a researcher yeah. to find why people are well, yeah. that may be great of a discovery. Yes. As no. Doctor told me. Of course, you know, we do that. You say, okay, here's a person with cancer. Sure. Who got well. Yeah. And I have collected a hundred thousand people that yeah. got well. Yeah. This can be done. You should come and work with us. So, <laughs> I, actually, I have, to, I have to say that, of course, I'm very interested because I'm in neurology in my training, and I have worked a little bit in multiple sclerosis. I work more on dementia, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy, but I'm a neurologist, so I know precisely the situation. In multiple sclerosis, the beauty is that the disease has a full spectrum from people that do very poorly to people that live a normal life. So it's a full spectrum. And so you probably are on the lucky side, yeah. and you will have a normal uh, life. Does anyone research the ones yeah. that have a normal life? Yeah. And yeah. Say, Why? So what are yeah. you doing different yeah. than that guy that's a woman in a wheelchair? Well, <clears throat> yeah. So some can be what they do, and some is the disease they have. So you see, it may be that the disease you got is be- more benign. So it's not that you did something special like diet or exercise, because I can say, well, let's see what he eats, let's see if he exercises, let's see what kind of lifestyle he has versus uh, other people. Yeah, that's one thing that we do all the time, and of course it's very important, but it may also be that the disease that you have is a benign form, which may have to do with genetic variables, may something that happened in, your, in life earlier. So sometimes it's, it's useful to do what you say. Sometimes it doesn't take you very far because you were already different. You see, like, even at the beginning, you were already having a less aggressive form of the disease. Other people got a more aggressive one. So no matter how much you work, it, you will not be able to stop it. So some, some may depend on what you do. Some will not. So in the case of MS, yeah, in the case of a multiple sclerosis, I think it's a combination of things. But certainly, it would be worth l- taking a group of people, suc- let's call them successful and unsuccessful. In compare. For example, in aging, we do look at successful people. So we say, take people that are 80 to 89, okay, or 90 to 99, 
and they are doing okay. They can walk, they can live by themselves, they can feed, dress, bathe, you know, they are self-sufficient. And let's call them successful aging. These are people that age well. And compare them to other people that depend on other people for care, they can't walk, they can't. And then look at what, what's different. Yeah, that has been done quite a bit. It's one of the methods of research. So, yes, and we can do, we can do more. So you should come and work with us. <laughs> other questions? I was, uh, I was born in uh, St. Mary's Hospital, and I'm 92 years old. Yes. And, um, and you've always been in Oxford County? Yeah. Good. Yeah, I've always lived here, and, uh, except for World War yeah, sure. II a couple of years. Sure. But um, I'm glad to give my records. Uh, I, I went to the VA for, for care for a few years, mm -hmm. but I'd be glad to see that you, they give you the records from there. And of course, it's a long list back to the back to the days when I had a tonsillectomy when yeah. I was uh, a couple of years old. <laughs> but you see so, the beauty of something like this. So you have, for us, it's like a line of time with all of your biography. So we can look at your life and, and, and learn from what happened to you. And you take one person, two person, 20, 50, 100. When you get to big numbers, you can really say, these things go together, these things don't go together. So it's an amazing, amazingly useful thing to do to have the full life of a person stored in a computer or in a system where people can, can really, because then we can learn something. And what we learn may not help you directly, but may help your son or your neighbors or your, I mean, it may not always help you directly, but will help other people like you. So, and people that came before you, if they gave their permission, then they helped you. So it, it's, it's a chain. Sure. Uh, the um, thing I'm wondering leading up to the question, what is it good for me? Outside of my feeling I'd like to do something for somebody else. Sure. Are there going to be any tests or anything that could be valuable to me? Yes. So if you simply say, many years ago you probably have signed a document saying uh, that we would have asked you, would you let us use your medical record information for research. It's called Minnesota authorization. And you probably have said yes. So after that, you are in unless you go there and you say, no, I want to withdraw. So that's as much as you have done. And probably your data have been used many times by many researchers. Now, there are situations where in re people like me look at you and they say, oh, you had uh, that appendectomy when he was 22, and we are interested in seeing them. So we may contact you by letter, inviting you to come in and do some tests. If you do that, then you may get some tests or some studies done on you special for the study. But if you do not get invited for one of these studies, you simply contribute passively. So your data are being used without you having to be bothered or you having to be contacted because you gave permission. But sometimes we invite people to come in and then we'll take your blood or we'll take a picture of your brain, or of your heart, and that does happen quite a bit. For example, right now there's a big study of um, cognitive changes when you get old. And so many people have been invited to be part of the study. And if you say yes, then you come in and you get tested. They test your memory. They test your ability to draw, to write. They test, uh, they take picture of your brain and then they give you some results back. So yes, we do research where we engage the people actively, but we also do a lot of more passive, which for some people is better because if you don't want to be bothered, then you don't need to be bothered. But have you been invited to do some projects? No. No, well, you might. You might be picked up. Sometimes it's just a lottery, like you know, we take all of the people of a certain age and we pick them up as a lottery. Some, some. I live about three, three city blocks away from here. So okay, so <laughs> you may, you may be, maybe you are very healthy. That's why we don't come. You know. <laughs> People that are very healthy tend not to be picked as much. So, for example, if I have hypertension or diabetes <coughs> or common diseases, the chances of being invited, like for example, I'm only 60, as I mentioned. 
but I was invited to be in a study of uh, kidney stone because I had an episode of pain, which was a little kidney stone. And so they found it in my record, and they say, oh, Dr. Rocca, we know that from your record that you had the pain and you had the kidney stone. Would you be part of the study? And I said, yes. So I came in, and they took certain exams. They, they took my urine. They took my blood. They asked me questions. So normally people get recruited on a specific uh, problem. But the problem is detected through the system, because in the system we know that you had a kidney stone or you didn't, you see? So they knew that I had a kidney stone, so they could contact me precisely knowing what was going on, which is tremendous, uh, tremendously useful. But you may be picked up. Yeah, I'm always interested in sort of the end results of the research. So yes. For example, if you look at the research that's been done in the last two or three years, what clinical uh, changes have, have occurred uh, that help the patient based on the research? That's one question. Another yeah. question I have is... This is an important one. Yeah, that's important. The other one has to do with... Yeah, you were talking about the difference between uh, Asian people uh, yeah. and others here in Olmstead County. Yeah. So my curiosity is if you take people who don't do as well on these ethnic things, for example, African Americans, and you put them in Asia, and you do a similar study there, would, would, would their environment actually raise them so that they, their, their mobility, mobility the, the, the problems that they have here would be lessened by going there? Is it the environment that's influencing that? There, like even people of other cultures who go to Asia, like what would happen there? Yes. Oh, you're a scientist. You're asking a very complicated question. <laughs> let, let me first answer the first one that is less complicated. Right. So, the... The Rochester Epidemiology Project has supported studies that led to 2,600 scientific publications. A publication is where you answer a specific, sometimes very small, but a small question. So there's been a huge production. But let me give you some examples that are tangible. In recent times, uh, there was a big question uh, about five, six years ago. Um, some people said that if you vaccinate your kids, they may develop psychiatric problems like autism. Autism is a very severe form of uh, problem in children. It's almost like a big psychiatric situation for children. And so the family that have people with autism are very concerned about that, of course, because it's a major problem. And there was this allegation that it, was, it could be triggered by vaccinating your children. So there was a movement in many countries of Europe and in the U.S. for parents to say, I don't want to vaccinate my children because I'm taking the risk of them developing a disease. But if you don't vaccinate your kids, then you take the risk of them getting an infectious disease, and some of these infectious diseases may actually be fatal. They may kill the, the baby. So you are choosing between taking a risk or another risk. And this was becoming quite a big problem. People using the data from the Rochester Epidemiology Project were one of the group, not the only one, but one of the group that showed that this is not true, that children that do receive vaccines do not have an increased risk of autism. And so we contributed to blocking this nonsense argument. And so now most people are convinced that there is not a risk or that the risk is small compared to the one that you take if you don't vaccinate the children, who may die. So I think the Rochester Epidemiology Project was a major player in blocking this debate. Another example is when you give anesthesia to children. I'm using children because it's very dramatic, okay? In aging, it's more soft, but in the children, things are serious. So if you take a child who was born with something that needs surgery, okay? Sometimes the surgery needs to be done immediately, like you have a heart problem and the blood is not pumping correctly. You need to operate, otherwise the baby dies. But there are other things like um, uh, joint problems, aesthetic things, that you can do early or later. So there was a debate when a baby is born with a problem. Should you, do, should you do a surgery early or should you do a surgery later? The problem with the surgery is that the kid needs to take anesthesia. Anesthesia is a chemical that blocks the neurons in the brain for a short period of time, but basically blocks the brain. That's the way you get no pain and, and no, no, the kid is out, okay, for the 
duration of the anesthesia. There is some concern that these chemicals may actually harm the brain cells long term, not just reversibly, and that this kid later, two, three, four years later, would have some problem in learning, concentration, performance, cognitive abilities. So the Mayo Clinic, Department of Anesthesia, conducted a big study, and now they are conducting a second study, and they show that if you do the surgery before the age of three, especially if you do more than one anesthesia, the kid will have delay in learning, delay in development, they will perform less, so quite serious, important, long-term effect. This has changed the recommendations. So if you read now the textbook of surgery, they say, a study from the Mayo Clinic has shown that surgery should be delayed as much as you can because children may suffer. So all of these things get translated into the practice. So even though it's not apparent immediately, it will change tomorrow practice. So you do research today and then you change what happens tomorrow. You cannot change yesterday, of course, but you can change tomorrow. I just wish to add something. Sort of like the two things you mentioned, I just wish there were some list, like a compendium of the accomplishments of that thing, the research has actually led to in concrete practice. It would be an interesting article to read. I mean, you read certain things for that book. No, no, but I mean even more specific. Like yes. Disease by disease. Kind yeah, of so, he, he, okay, so if you want brief stories, some are here. If you want to go deeper, then um, if you go into our website, you will find a tab called Publications. If you touch that publication, it gives you a window where you can type, let's say you are interested in uh, asthma or migraine. You are interested in, uh, you choose, prostate problem. Okay? You type the name of the disease and it tells you all of the publications that the Rochester Epidemiology Project has contributed to that specific question. It's amazing. I do it all the time. So let's say you want to know about thyroid disease. Okay, you type thyroid and then return. Shoom, you get the list of the papers. And then you can link, open the paper. These get connected with Washington, with the National Library of Medicine. Even though you don't see any of that, you just simply click. You keep clicking and you get the paper. And you can read it, of course. So we try to make, you know, like uh, lay people summaries, but of course, between the lay people and the science, there's a big range. Yeah. So some people want it simple, like I was giving you simple stories. But I can go very deep if you want. I can start talking about chemically, chemistry or, or pharmacology. But that's, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned and also, I guess, like I'm a type 2 diabetic. If I were to type in diabetes yes. and just see exactly what's been accomplished by the studies in diabetes, Correct. it would be interesting rather than reading all the rationale no. behind it, but just reading the yeah. results. Yeah, so if you go into the website, okay, the website has tabs on top, okay, there are blue tabs with yellow text. You touch publications, and this will open, and there's a window, you just type diabetes, return. Diabetes uh, that I'm aware of, it's not my field, I'm a brain person, so I do aging and brain, so diabetes is not quite my, my field. But I know we have done, for example, studies looking at diabetes and the risk of dementia and cognitive decline. We have done uh, things on, we have looked at diabetes as one of the diseases that go together with other diseases. So you, you will find some interesting things. Oh, and the second question is very important. So you are asking a fundamental question. So if I say, so the European have this risk, the Asian have less risk and the African American have more risk, okay? So the question is, is that some genetic constitutional factor or is it something related to lifestyle? Food, diet, religion, lifestyle, okay? Because your ethnic group normally brings language, religion, food, right? And so the, so the question is, what is it? So to address that question, Studies have been done, for example, on cardiovascular disease, let's say myocardial infarction. And for example, they had noted that Japanese and Oriental tended to have less risk than American or Europeans, Western Europeans. So years ago, they did a study looking at people that moved from Japan to Hawaii and then from Hawaii to California. 
Okay? So you would take people that are genetically from Japan, like Okinawan, from the Okinawan Islands. They move for war reason, economical reason, migration reason to Hawaii, and then they come to California. And then you say, will the risk remain the same as in Okinawa? Or will it become the same as Hawaii and then the same as California? And partly it becomes the same as California and Hawaii. Because when you take a person living with a certain diet and a certain environment, and you move them to a different environment where the food is less good, the quality of the food is less good, the lifestyle is more sedentary, urban, they do tend to develop manifestations similar to the place where they live. Some will still remain different if it is related to genetic factors. So sometimes the answer is half and half or partly. But we have done a lot of studies of migration. So you take people born in a country, and then you, they move to another country. And they, sometimes they bring with themselves the food habits, the language, the religion. Sometimes then the, the next generation <coughs> may get completely absorbed into the new place. So you can do studies, and some have been done. It's a little bit, yeah. I would say that that's a little bit um, a simpli an oversimplification. I would say there is a piece and a piece. Whether it's 50, 50, or 70, 30, I'm not, depend on the disease. I wouldn't say it's 50, 50 necessarily. But there is a component which is linked to the way you genetically are built. And then there's a component which depends on your experiences as a child, as an adolescent, as an adult, the food the lifestyle, the environment where you live. Yeah, so it's a combination, and it depends. But I would say, yeah, it's the two go together. But there are many studies done on uh, cardiovascular disease in migrants, multiple sclerosis in migrants were studied, very beautiful studies. They were taking people uh, from, because in multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis is a disease of the brain. I'm talking about that because uh, we have a person that it's a disease of the brain that is like an inflammation of the brain. Okay, it's an oversimplification, but and this seems to go with the sunshine. So, if you live near the equator, you have the least, and then when you move up through the U.S. and through Canada and through Alaska, the, the more north you go, the less you get. Okay, so as if it goes with the sunshine meaning that when you have a lot of sunshine, you don't get the disease. The least sunshine you have, you get more disease. So the Canadian have more than people in Mississippi. Does it make sense? Okay, and so there has been a lot of question. What, does it, what is the difference? Is it the sunshine? Is it the food? Is it the genetics? Is it because, of course, people living in the Caribbean are different from the people living in Alaska in many ways, not just because the, the day is shorter and it's colder. And so they have done studies where they would take people born let's say, in Jamaica and move to Toronto and see whether the risk is the same as Toronto or the same as Jamaica. And they even look at what age you migrate. Did you migrate as a kid or did you migrate as an adult? Because if you migrate as a small child, then you live through your adolescence. In Toronto, if you moved when you were 40 because you got a job in a company, then you had already grown. So it's not just where you live, but when did you move? and what did your body experience when you grew? It's a very interesting area. I'm very interested in this kind of stuff. Men and women, when they move like that, do they, do those factors change equally with their movements or what? Good question. <laughs> you and I should work together. Okay, well, one of my area of research right now is the difference between men and women in medicine. I think in the future, the medicine for men and women will be splitting a bit because we more and more discovered that it's not the same. So. Treating men and women like the same is good politically, is good socially, but not medically, because medicine is very different in men and women. There are hormonal factors, reproductive factors. There are many, many differences, as you know. So one of my area of research is to show the differences between men and women, and I think it is not the same, especially because of the hormonal changes and the reproduction, because reproduction is a very, very important field of experience that women experience and, and men do not in the same way. So, so yes, I think it would, I predict it does make a difference. And I think in the next 
15, 20 years, you will hear a lot about men and women medicine. There was a question? Yeah. Is your study going to take into account the physical activity of the people also? Yes. So, so physically... I, I had a friend who was 65 when she was born, or her father was 65 when she was born, and uh, he had children from his first marriage. And when he was 102 years old, the newspaper had taken a picture of him out shoveling in the snow, and there's kids uh, from the first marriage that were in his knees, called her and told her, you can't let dad do that anymore, he's too old. Yes. Until she stopped him. Well, she said he died about 104 and a half or so. But anyway, he, she said she could see him failing because he wasn't doing it. And she said she felt so, felt so bad that she made him stop. Yes. I also have a friend who's, because the Texas over here, where I had a country club down there, this day. She's 101 last year. 101? 101. She still golfs three times a week. Yeah. Now her, her daughter, and she drove her car, lived by herself and everything. Now her daughter said, you're too old to do that, Ma. You have to move to an assisted living and take, you know, take your car away and all this stuff. So I'm going to see what she's doing this year. Yeah. But I feel that if you take an older person and you tell them you can't do this anymore, I think that affects them mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think this is a real problem. Yeah. So this is very interesting because um, there's a lot of discussion about physical exercise. I think physical exercise is essential and I think people should continue to remain as active as they can be short of breaking their bones or falling or I mean if it becomes dangerous because you fall or you break your bones and if you break your bone when you are 100 it's, it's a serious deal as you know very well if you break your bone when you are 17 because you ski is not a big deal well may not be as big but if you break your bone when you are 90 it's, it's a serious problem so I would say that to the limit that it's safe, I would do as much as I can until I can. It's interesting because you don't need to do things very uh, extreme, just walking, simply walking or swimming or doing something very soft and not dangerous may be extremely useful. Not, we used to think that it's useful because you burn calories. No, I don't think so. I think it's useful because your brain is following the motion so the motion to me as a neurologist is interesting as a rhythm to your brain more than burning sugar okay it's not to burn sugar or to stay fit it's also that but it's more important the mental activity that goes with the motor because all of our motion is controlled by the brain and the brain the same brain that you used to think and to remember is the one that you used to walk or to swim or to do jobs so I think the activity is global, and you need to keep the whole body functioning. So I would recommend as much activity as possible until you can, but to avoid the risk of breakage, I would do something soft, like walking, swimming, you know, not, not brave things, not silly things, because then if you break bones, then you get stuck for a month or so, you get cast, you get boots, you get... so. It's, it, you have to keep it in, in balance. But the people that go beyond 100, they are all very active. They tend to eat and drink and do all kinds of things that they're not supposed to do. Yes, and they're enjoying it. You know, there was this famous lady from France that was supposed to be the oldest woman ever, and she would take pictures always with a glass of champagne. She would not even take pictures without champagne. She said, let's not even waste time. So let's have a glass of champagne, then you can take a picture. So, and she was, she was not supposed to drink. But. So it's, it's, I think, and plus there has to be some overall sense of life, which is, compl you know, like it's, it's, life has also to be entertaining and fun. Because if you are depressed from the very morning to the evening, you won't go very far. So, I mean, this idea that, oh, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot do that. Then I say, what? I mean, I'm already dead before I die, so... I think there's a balance there. But. I have a second question now. It's different in your, your study, but uh, stem cells research. Yes. Now, I read uh, recently before I came down here today for my uh, checkup that they're doing some stem cell research as far as regeneration of the retina. Yes. Now, three months ago, I had a uh, uh, stroke in my right eye. Mm -hmm. And so my retina is damaged. Yeah. I have lost the majority of my sight, well, almost all my sight. Things are blurry now, and I can okay. just see uh, stuff off the periphery. Is there anything done where they, they can do anything like that now, where they do some stem cells and insert them in the retina, they have the retina regenerate? 
Well, stem cell is a new horizon. Uh, whether it's ready for an immediate use now, very few indications. So it's a field, it's a field of research. It's a lot of effort is being done. I think it's promising, but for most of the application I'm aware of, we are not yet there. You know, we are not ready to just take some stem cell and inject them in you. So as far as I know, we have some, but limited application clinically. So this is more like a new area of research. But the stem cell is very interesting because we also have stem cells that we have ourselves before any doctor intervenes. So we are learning more also about the ability of the body itself to respond to lesions or insults without the doctors having to intervene. Because in the past, we didn't understand that there was this potential for regeneration, for healing inside our own body. So there is some level of stem cell potential of regeneration which comes with our body naturally. And then there is this uh, line of research that is trying to do, to develop injectable or transplantable stem cells. I think it's moving fast. I'm, I don't know, I don't know particularly about the uh, retina, but they have tried some in the heart. They've done some experiment on the heart that seemed to work well. Of course, if you talk about like blood, then it's very easy, you know, transplanting cell of the blood is easy because they are just moving little cells. They are not part of a tissue. So, so in, in the blood, hematology it will be sooner. And then the heart has been tried. I know they are trying to do something in the brain, but I don't think we are ready to solve your problem immediately, but I hope I'm wrong. The, bo the body, the body is amazingly. Yeah, so we are. Still isn't what I like because it's. Thing, I can see outlines of people, but that's about it. <laughs> how, how, how long ago did it happen? About three months ago. Yeah, it, it, it may keep uh, evolving a bit. I mean, I'm not saying that you'll go back to him, but but the body does have the potential to compensate, regenerate uh, to to some extent, of course. I mean, no, you cannot. I want to speed up with some stem cells. Here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's complicated, but there will be some, rec uh, rec you know, you will recover a little bit more, but then you will reach a certain level and you will not go beyond that. But, but I think it's, it's potentially interesting in the stem cells. The problem sometimes is that I think it is not correct to promise people things that you cannot deliver. So sometimes people will promise you to do some magic uh, surgery on you, and sometimes they do it also because they, you will pay the bill, and, and that, I think, is very unfortunate. So I think you have to be realistic. You know, There are things that we can do and things that we cannot do. The one that we can do, we should do when they are justifiable. But I feel that they wanted to try it. I mean, they could do it because they couldn't get any worse. Than okay, yeah, so you have nothing to lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you understand what I'm yeah, saying. That researchers have everything to gain. Yeah, yeah. But, but some people, by contrast, put themselves in the end of non-competent person that they promise them something and they do something which is worse than they had not done it. So I'm always concerned when patients get, you know, enticed in doing something. But well, yeah, maybe may it's fine, yeah. No, we, we are safe. We, here it's safe. Nobody will do anything that we are not comfortable with. So, I mean, the people here, that's, that's what the mayor is. We only look at the pros and cons and discuss it with you. And we wouldn't do it just for the money or just for the sake of being spectacular. We'd rather be serious. Yeah. <laughs> okay, other questions? Yes. 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 Yeah, that's a very good question. So, as I said, my area of research is the brain, brain aging, how people get old in the brain, primarily the, the central brain, so dementia, Parkinson's disease, stroke. 
Now, uh, we did a study of Parkinson's disease. You remember Parkinson's disease is a disease where people tend to be stiff, they can't move very much, they shake when they sit or they rest, they lean forward, they tend to fall. It, it kind of, sometimes they function okay mentally, but they, they, they can't move. They can't move well. And it can be treated, and it's, it's relatively uh, um, a, a reasonable disease to get. If people ask me, what disease do you want to get? If I have to get one, maybe Parkinson, I might even take it. So it is bad, but it's not as bad as other things. So we looked in Olmsted County over 30 years. So we count all of the people that develop the disease every year for 30 years in this community. The question was, are we getting more or less than before? So does it change? And the first 15 years, there was not much going on. But then in the last 15 years or so, more and more people started developing the disease. And so we saw a trend increasing the risk of people in Oxford County to develop Parkinson's disease. At the same time, the people had a little bit less risk of developing dementia or cognitive decline. So there seem to be things going on in the community which have to do with changing lifestyle, changing medication, changing something that we are still trying to figure out, where one disease becomes less common, but another disease becomes more common, almost as if they were an interplay. So the study that we just published was the first big study in the world to show that, and it was possible because Olmsted County has the record linkage system. You cannot do it in another county. You cannot do it in another place. They can do it maybe in, in Denmark or in Iceland or in some places of Europe, but in the U.S. it was, that's why we were the, the first to do it. And then the question was, so why is that? And the media, the newspaper, were very excited because they said maybe it was smoking because there is a story saying that people who develop Parkinson's disease were less likely to smoke, okay? So people that smoke a lot will not develop Parkinson's disease. People that smoke little or non-smoke tend to get more Parkinson's disease. So people believe that it was the smoking that did something good to the brain and protected the disease, which I don't think is the case. I think it's the people that early on in life could not tolerate the smoking because they get intoxicated. They are the one predisposed to Parkinson's disease, so they are not one causing the other, but they go together. So anyway, so the media was saying, oh, maybe because people in Minnesota stopped smoking, fortunately, and the smoking went from 50% to 20% in Minnesota. Minnesota was one of the first states to introduce laws to block smoking in public places and all of that. So we went from 50% of the population, one every two people was smoking after the war, down to 20%, even less. And the women were less before, but then they picked up, so now men and women are smoking as much. So before it was the men and the women very little. Then the men came down, the women stayed flat or went up a bit, and now men and women are smoking 20% in Minnesota. So the question was, is your Parkinson's disease due to smoking? And they say, no, I don't think so, not necessarily. Could be, could be part, but because I think that smoking and Parkinson go together, but they are not one causing the other. And so then the other question would be, so then what else has changed? Well, there were new drugs that came in the pharmacies and some were taken away. And then there were new chemicals introduced in agriculture. So for example, if you look at people uh, in, in agriculture, they use herbicides and pesticides, okay, to control the weeds and the bugs. Well, some of these chemicals have been shown to be toxic to the brain. And so after World War II, with the introduction of the advanced agriculture, we introduced a lot of chemicals that were not available before World War II. And so these progressively became more and more, got into the water, into the ground, into the food. So it is possible that it could be a change in the environment, in the, chemi in the chemical in the environment. And this has to be, of course, tested, but this is one of the hypotheses that we have raised. So could it be related to smoking? Maybe, a tiny bit. Could it be related to agricultural changes? Maybe, it has to be proven. Or maybe something else has changed. But, so these are the kind of things that we can do by having access to this data. And this was done without having to bother anybody. These people did not need to receive a letter, a telephone call. They did not need to come in for a test. 
they simply accept it to have their data used for research, possibly, and they helped us immensely without us having to bother them. Of course, I mean, if we want to do another study, we can invite them. Like if now we want to look at some blood test or something, we can write a letter and say, would you want to help us doing this study? And if you want, then we'll follow up. But yeah, that was a big study. Yeah, expanding the areas will be very nice because now we get all of these counties in the southeast corner which are very rural because Rochester, it's not a big city, but it's a city. And then we have La Crosse, we have Eau Claire, so we have cities, okay? But then we have a lot of small communities, three, four, five, six thousand people, and those are the ones that will be interesting from the farming, from the low density of population. And Yes, yes. I think there's a tremendous amount of things that can be. So even though we are doing a lot, we publish 2,600 papers, if we had the, the people and the energy and the funding, a lot more could be done. So in a sense, I, sometimes I feel we are sitting on a gold mine and we only dig a tiny bit because, I mean, I can only do what I can do. I've done, all, I've done research here for 23 years and I've done a piece, you know, but if we were 100 of us, we could do a lot more. So it's, it's time, it's money, it's commitment, it's interest, it's, you know. Yeah. We come, I come from a very country. Oh, what country? Central. That's Central, okay. Oh, Jamaica. When someone's old, and they're only 55 or 60, yeah. and, you know, they can have very old person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad I'm not living there without the system. Yeah, there are many things. <coughs> okay, so in certain countries, for example, um, even the infectious diseases are not well controlled. You know, like here, we, we take for granted that when you have an infectious disease, you get an antibiotic, you are out of it after three days, children get vaccinated, uh, pregnant women are controlled. I mean, like, in certain countries, you, you start getting in trouble when you're a child because you get infected. You get in trouble when you're pregnant. You get in trouble, I mean... You understand, the life is a continuous challenge where we have overcome all of these things, so now we are facing other issues, but certainly some of the basics in a place like Minnesota are not of concern. I mean, so you understand the difference. So your body reached 50 where you have already got severe infections, severe trauma. Sometimes the work conditions are also very uh, more severe. Uh, the nutrition, the food may not be as good. So you put it all together, you see why these people are, are getting old sooner because they were not sheltered through. Um, I was just thinking, I, you mentioned it a couple of times, funding, but I'm funding from like Michigan, money. I'm from Michigan, and we weren't included. You know, you yeah. said like Wisconsin, and, and you were yeah. expanding, but it looked like you were kind of Michigan is fine. Running them away from Michigan. No, no, I have nothing against Michigan. <laughs> Actually, Michigan is doing some very good research as well, yeah. Yeah, university? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a very strong tradition of environmental research. You know, Michigan is, you know, I was just talking about the Midwest because it's easier to envision. But Because there you have Chicago in the middle, and Chicago is a big city, so it has different issues. You know, like Chicago in the Midwest is different from the rest because it's really a metropolis, you know, you have all of the other issues, but. But no, the funding, I was saying, because um, some of these research still cost money, even though we use data there in the computer, but you still have to, it's still expensive. Yeah, and, and is that when, because I'm, I'm in a clinical study here, and I'm always supporting that particular okay. clinical study, but when they do a general call out for funds, you know, how they always are doing it all the time, do you get a portion of that, or is it specific to your area? How does that well, work? Well, um, so uh, normally many of the researches that we do are funded through the government. So we write an application, we send it to Washington, okay. we compete nationally, and if we succeed, then we get money to do studies. These tend to be bigger amount of money and for a long period, like five years. Like, for example, the Rochester Epidemiology Project <laughs> has now been funded by the government. So this research is funded by, by Washington. And uh, we are funded uh, 2,000, 
2015 to 2020. Okay, so we have five years, and this is very good because it gives you a time frame where you can develop projects, you can do things without having to worry next January, next February. Okay. Uh, we also do get funding from the Mayo Clinic, and this is from a donor. A donor gave money to the Mayo Clinic for the study of healthcare delivery or how to improve the care of patients. So we open a center for the study of healthcare delivery, and that center is helping us, giving us some money to support the Rochester Epidemiology Project. So we get money from uh, private donor philanthropists and from the government and, and yeah, together. And so it, it's a combination. But the government is good because uh, it tends to be bigger amount of money, which is important. And also it tends to be <clears throat> very prestigious because it means that you have gone through a competition. So having money from Washington is a proof of quality because you go through peers that look and say, oh, look at what they are doing. Are they spending the money well? Where philanthropists can just say, oh, I want to build that or to build that. It can be more capricious. It's still welcome, but it's more, you know, it's less controlled. Because people say, I, can, I want to build a wall, and I build a wall, and I want it blue, and you do it blue. At NIH and at Washington, you have to go through a panel of people saying, well, why do you want to do it blue, and are you sure it's tall enough? You know, like. So uh, the research done via competition is a better quality. It's more prestigious. I think it's a good, it's a good thing to, to have your peers criticizing you so you do it better. You know, don't just take the first approach and go. Other questions or comments? I, I beg you all to go to our website. And, and if you don't like to do computer, maybe get your grandson or somebody to help you and, and get into the computer and look at the website. There are videos that you can click on, and they tell you the story of the Rochester Epidemiology Project. We have one in Spanish, one in Somali, one in English. We have one of eight minutes, one of four minutes, depending on how much patience you have. You can look at that. And then you can look at the publication, which is an amazing experience. I really recommend you to look at your disease or disease that you're interested, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, retinal diseases or uh, eye diseases. Or you can try different keywords or multiple sclerosis. Or multiple sclerosis is huge. Actually, <coughs> the person who invented the Rochester Epidemiology Project, Leonard Kurland, initially invented it to study multiple sclerosis. You will not believe it because it's a, it's a relatively rare disease. But he was a neurologist like me, and he was interested in multiple sclerosis. So he initially thought that this was the best place to study multiple sclerosis. So the list of papers on multiple sclerosis is huge just because of historical coincidence. It just happened to be that way. So it's, yeah, it's a lucky disease in that sense. Good. Thank you so much. Oh. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we also have lip balms and, and uh, all kind of stuff. All kind of stuff. This is the Spanish.